and they're playing just brave stock in this stage, which he will break. On September 28, 1972, millions of Canadians from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific offer a silent prayer and hold their breath. Holy gee. Both teams have given everything and it's been one of the best games I think I've ever seen. Canada versus the Soviets. The clash of the two greatest hockey powers in the world. When you have to come from behind a two-goal lead, it shows their spirit, their ability, and everything else. It's the dying moments of the last game in Moscow, and the series is tied. And you can feel attention almost everywhere. And then, the moment. Anderson made a wild stab for spell. Here's another shot. Right the Summit Series raises international competition to new heights. But the 1970s also bring strange and profound changes to the world of hockey. As the game expands its reach, a renegade league ushers in hockey's decade of madness and mayhem. In the spring of 1971, two decades of Cold War have generated a cloud of antagonism and deep mistrust. Ten years after the Berlin Wall went up, East and West remain locked in ideological stalemate. In this atmosphere of failed diplomacy, Canada offers a small gesture of detente, disguised as a hockey game. Beer and hockey, call it foreign policy by other means. On an outdoor rink in Moscow, the Canadian Embassy hockey team takes on a friendly game. Second Under Secretary Gary Smith plays left defense. Punch Imlac gave us old Maple Leaf jerseys, so we call ourselves the Moscow Maple Leafs. We play against the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Trade, Task News, and the Grinders from Accordion Factory No. 7. It's our way of letting out a bit of frustration. Smith is fluent in Russian and a specialist in Soviet government. Soon after arriving in Moscow in early 1971, he's asked to take on a big job. One of my very first assignments is to prepare the first official visit of the Prime Minister of Canada to the Soviet Union. Pierre Trudeau is the first North American leader to go to the USSR, and he's hoping to soften Cold War attitudes. Among the pressing international issues on the agenda, there's the topic of hockey. Canada has never been able to send NHL players to the World Championships because the International Ice Hockey Federation has a ban on professional players. In protest, Canada has withdrawn completely from international competition. And no one misses the Canadians more than the Soviets. Isvestia, the state newspaper, decries the lack of a decent rival. The Soviets have grown tired of defeating other nations year after year. At the Isvestia tournament, the World Hockey Championships, and the Olympic Games, we want a new challenge and stronger competition. The embassy gets the message loud and clear. The Russians want to play Canada's pros. Gary Smith is summoned to a meeting with key members of the powerful Soviet Sports Federation. It's a tradition for the embassy to send over the highlight film from the Stanley Cup Finals. But this year, it's an invitation to talk business. 
We discussed a series of friendly matches between Canada's NHL players and the USSR. Just a few friendly matches. It's the opening Canadian hockey officials have been waiting for. Later, when they saw Bobby Hall skate, they thought the film had been sped up. It takes three months to work out the details, but the Summit Series is launched. This was the opportunity for us as Canadians to fly across the pond, to play the communists on their own ground, to bring the communists into play on our ground, ground to beat the pants off them. It was just a marvelous bit of fire for that burgeoning Canadian identity. But the Soviet national team also has the fire. They call themselves amateurs, but they're full-time hockey players, trained under the merciless eye of Anatoly Tarasov. Facing Canadian professionals with our team has always been the dream to show the world that our system is supreme. When the Soviet team flies to Canada for the first four games of the series, Gary Smith goes along as escort and translator. They're in awe and quite uncertain of what to expect. Most of the young guys want to talk about Bobby Orr and Bobby Hull. But Bobby Hull is barred by the NHL after he quit the Blackhawks to play in a rival league. Bobby Orr is on the team, but he's hurt and won't play a single shift. Still, the Canadian team and its fans are confident. Unlike our American cousins, Canadians grew up with very few national myths. Things that we can readily grab out of the hat and say, this is us, this is who we are. And one of the most dependable has always been hockey. It's our game, we perfected it, we gave it to the world in all forms. It's ours, and we are best at it. Players, fans, sports writers, all believe there's no way Canada can lose. Against our boys, the Russians will be trounced. Either we take every single game, or I'll eat this column shredded at high noon in a bowl of borscht on the front steps of the Russian embassy. All of this was a perfect, you know, setup for our demonstration of what we and the rest of the world knew. We were the best. And it would be a complete and utter celebration of us. Then, you know, Montreal. <laughs> you know, first game. You know, and I'm the goalie. Seats for game one are in such demand, there's a lottery for tickets. Mac McDermott is one of the lucky few. For a hockey fan, this is the ultimate confrontation. The bad guys versus the good guys. Our philosophy and culture pitted against theirs. Finally, the series we had waited years for has arrived. It just doesn't get any better than this. René Le Cavalier will call the game for French Canada, and the legendary Foster Hewitt has come out of retirement to do the English play-by-play. -play. The game is underway with Petrov having cleared it into the Canadian zone. Canada clear on the board, but there's the pass to Plato. Big stop, here's a shot, right spot, and it's gone! Canada scores two quick goals, and all the predictions seem to ring true. And then, the red machine finds its legs. The Montreal Forum is shocked into silence. Well, I remember I was sitting with my wife in Rochester and I was watching the game. She started to uh, kid me, eh? And uh, you know, I said, Rose, don't kid. I'm not kidding, because it was like death. Like I'm watching this was eight. I mean, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. In the end, it's a thrashing. The Soviets take the game easily, 
seven to three. And everybody in Canada went, holy smokes, who are these guys and what are they doing and why are they skating that way and why are they beating us? Now, it's like it's, it's as if the little green men landed and came out and said hi. And you suddenly say, boy, we're not alone in the universe. As the series moves to Toronto, the nation's faith in Team Canada is shaken. Players, coaches, and fans fear the whole series could be lost on this night. Team Canada plays with a passion bordering on desperation. Halfway through the game, Canada is leading two to one when the Soviets get a power play. The game is hanging by a thread. And then Pete Mahovlich shows a flash of brilliance. The series is tied. Canada is back in it, and the country breathes a sigh of relief. After a tie in Winnipeg, Vancouver is Team Canada's last game on home ice. Petriac is being held on that last play by Mahomlin, stuck right with him. Petriac couldn't even get up. The Canadians lose, and they lose ugly. From the stands, everyone can hear the chorus of boos. After the game, Phil Esposito speaks for a wounded hockey team. For the people across Canada, we tried, we did our best, and uh, for the people that boo us, geez, I, I'm really, I, all of us guys are really disheartened and we're disillusioned and we're disappointed in some of the people. We cannot believe the bad press we've got, uh, the, the booing we've gotten in our own buildings. I mean, most, every one of us guys, 35 guys that came out and played for Team Canada, we did it because we love our country and not for any other reason, no other reason. We came because we love Canada. All kinds of Canadian insecurities have now manifested. Could the Russians possibly be better? It's a thought too terrible to contemplate. The players are demoralized. But one thing that saved many a team is that they go on the road. Team Canada heads overseas with just a single victory. Only a handful of fans show up to see the team off. Missiles and marching. In 1972, that's about all most Canadians know about life in the Soviet Union. But among the mysteries behind the Iron Curtain, the flash of familiar images. Hockey is a common language shared by those who love the game. And it's that passion for hockey that brings 3,000 Canadian fans to Moscow in September 1972. It's the largest crowd of tourists allowed in since the Russian Revolution. Mac McDermott wouldn't miss it for anything. We were able to walk around freely, or so we thought, but we were contained in the center of Moscow. They did tell us not to wave our flags in the street or in the arena. Canadian fans immediately defy the rules. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished friends and comrades. In the Luzhniki Ice Palace, they're the loudest crowd of flag wavers to ever cheer for a hockey team. As the players are introduced, Phil Esposito's skate blade catches on a flower petal. The stumble seems to break the tension on the Team Canada bench, and they jump out to a three-goal lead. In the stands, the Canadian fans go wild as Soviet officials fume.
When a trumpet blare was heard, a cop rose from his seat and started looking around to see who was doing it. The Canadian fans started pointing in all directions except where he was. The rabble rouser is Pierre Plouffe, who's managed to smuggle a trumpet into the arena. They also wanted to confiscate my Canadian flag. When we show strong sentiment that's deemed to be unacceptable by the state, they'd shake us up. In the third period, disaster. The Soviets score four times in two and a half minutes, and the game is over. For Team Canada, one more defeat, and the series is lost. But then the Canadian fans do something remarkable. We gave the team a standing ovation and sang O Canada at the top of our lungs. We are a part of Team Canada too. The few fans who were Canadian that were in there were fighting for, for not only them as hockey players, but fighting for lifestyle and belief in how they lived. And they were standing forward and defending these players. And I think the players really fed off of that. Coach Harry Sinden knows that cheer means the series is really just beginning. Well, somehow that and the thousands of telegrams from home are having a huge impact on our guys. Now we know we're up against it and that we just can't let the country down. And sometimes churches also have 13 domes, 12 apostles and one Christ. So that is the typical composition for the Russian churches. In the break so between the games, like many of the Canadian fans sign up for guided tours. Meanwhile, back at the Team Canada Hotel, the Soviets are busy. Imported food and beer mysteriously go missing, and players are frequently awakened in the middle of the night by prank phone calls. There were a lot of tension. They were telling me, uh, some of them, they say, Jean, if you only knew the pressure we have on the ice. One said, he said, it's a war up there. And I could see, and I could feel. Game six, Bobby Clark and Valerie Harlamov have been mixing it up all game. Then, a vicious slash, and Harlamov is gone with a broken ankle. State filmmakers compile a gallery of images that will portray the Canadians as thugs. But the Soviets have their own dirty tricks, and Phil Esposito makes no apologies. It was a war, a real live war. It wasn't a game anymore, it was society against society. Hockey as we know it would never be the same again. And in this war, both sides do whatever's necessary to win. What you're looking to do is to raise the emotional level to a point where you just generate more and more and more and more energy. And, and, and the energy that generates new possibility. You know, you do things beyond what your mind would ever imagine. Team Canada gets the victory. And when the celebrations continue back at the hotel bar, Pierre Plouffe is in the thick of it. With perhaps a few too many on his bar tab, he crashes into a table and gets arrested. I asked them to agree in writing to bring me back to the hotel. When I was at the station, the officer ripped up the agreement saying, this is what we do with paper in the Soviet Union. He's thrown in jail and told he's facing five years in Siberia. I'm scared and have to stay in jail, locked up for game seven. My guards let me watch it on TV. Game seven is out and out combat. When the smoke clears, Canada holds the field and the series is tied. Now it all comes down to one final game. We've been told by everybody we're supposed to be the best hockey nation, and here it is, game eight of this series, and it's still in doubt. 
and we're going to sit there for whatever it is, two hours from the Luzhniki Arena and have this all determined. The sense of tension in the country was enormous. <laughs> Televisions are wheeled into classrooms. Businesses shut for the day. Virtually all of Canada comes to a standstill, united by a mixture of hope and dread. In Moscow, even Pierre Plouffe won't miss the game, escorted to the Luzhniki Ice Palace by armed guards. I'm not allowed to sit with any Canadian fans. I'm not allowed to applaud or cheer. I'm behind a Soviet bench in a sea of militia. The air in the Moscow arena here is tense. In a last minute switch, the Soviets drop one of the referees and bring in a hand-picked replacement. They nearly uh, caused a riot in the discussions prior to the game. The uh, start of the game was very much in doubt. They're up until noon today. When the game starts, the new referee goes to work fast. And the Soviet fans, there's a dive. There was a real dive there. There'll be a penalty. And Peter Mahoffley breaks himself on him. Canada is called for two penalties and plays the first four minutes of the game shorthanded. Then, a third penalty Also takes his pass. He's knocked over by, and there'll be a penalty there. And just one penalty after another. And is totally intense at this call. Team Canada explodes in a rage. I'm afraid this kind of officiating is going to cause more than one incident before this game is over. By the time they start the third period, the Soviets hold a two-goal lead. But Phil Esposito scores a quick one. And then, with seven minutes left in the game, Team Canada scores again to tie it up. It's going! or so it appears. The Soviet goal judge does not hit the red goal light. Alan Eagleson, the man who'd helped put Team Canada together, leaps from his seat, furious. When the Soviet police try to arrest him, the Canadian players go after him. And I believe Alan Eagleson is in on it over there as far as we can tell. Eagleson is escorted to the Canadian bench. The police were trying to throw Eagleson out. The goal is allowed. Now, the series and the game are tied with less than a minute to play. Given everything, it has been one of the best games I think I've ever seen. And the Cardinal has it on that wing. Here's a shot. Henderson made a wild stab for spell. Here's another shot. Fights by the floor. Every part of you just sort of spills out onto the floor in a puddle of mellow and, and of like, oh, it's over, it is over, it is over. And they fought like tigers tonight to come right through. That sense of catharsis that we nearly lost it all is now released with victory. And it's one of those moments that if you were alive and sentient and over the age of five, you know where you were when it happened. I felt I wasn't Canadian. It's the same thing when the war was over, right? Eh? God, it's Canadian! I think the 72 series defines hockey ultimately as Canada's sport. It's the one that defines us internationally. And we saw what happened in 72 when our national pride was on the line, when it looked like we were going to lose, and we understood what it meant to us. And I think that was really an important thing politically, and I think it was an important thing nationally. And it was an important thing for hockey because it changed the way hockey was played on the ice as well. I mean, more people talk about it today than even probably back then. Uh, had they won back, if it had been today, they probably would have had a parade for them. They probably would have shut down the country for them. Uh, we didn't know how to do all those things. We didn't even know how to celebrate because, you know, it was the first time we had gone through something like this. We just knew we were proud. 
As for prisoner Pierre Plouffe, he's released with a warning and a story he'll remember for years. I am so proud to be a Canadian. Our character, our will, and our refusal to surrender is something I will remember for the rest of my life. This is our legacy. June 1972. The city of Winnipeg is buzzing with the news. Pro hockey is coming to town, and Bobby Hull is leading the parade. Larry Secular skips class and heads downtown. The crowd is huge. It's absolutely electric. Everybody is cheering and asking for autographs. Oh, the NHL always shut out Winnipeg. But now, with the World Hockey Association, we're on the map. Bobby Hull has been lured away from the NHL by the richest contract in hockey history, plus a million dollar signing bonus. Winnipeg Jets owner Ben Hatskin figures he's worth every penny. Bobby Hull means instant credibility in the minds of the public and the news media. He's our trump card. The World Hockey Association has fulfilled a dream for Winnipeggers. The WHA also brings new teams to Ottawa, Edmonton, and Quebec City. Maurice Richard, Quebec's most revered hockey player, comes out of retirement to coach the Nordique. He only lasts two weeks, but still, it's a public relations coup for the new league. The WHA is significant for two things. It brings a whole bunch of Canadian cities in, gives them teams, and for the first time, hockey players find out that they have real value as businessmen. The Bobby Hull defection starts a mass exodus as other stars follow. Even Gordy Howe is persuaded to come out of retirement. Nearly a hundred players bolt from the NHL and its farm teams to join the WHA, and all more than double their salaries. The NHL has not been challenged as a league for a long time now, nearly 50 years. And the organizers of the WHA were shrewd enough to see that. They saw that there was a hockey market not being served in Canada, in the birthplace of the game. And they weren't going to get the cup, but they were going to get premier professional hockey, and who knew where that might lead. The WHA starts the 1972 season with 12 new teams, and thus begins a seven-year war with the NHL. Quality is one of the first casualties. The rapid expansion of pro hockey means too many slots, not enough talent. In the 70s, what happens is, because the product is diluted, there aren't as many skilled players around, but you have to sell tickets. What do you sell? You sell the violence. You sell the rock and sock in School of Hockey. And to me, that's where it really took root. Nothing fills the stands like a brawl. Fighting had always been a byproduct of the game, but until now, it had never been used as a marketing tool. Hockey was marketed as kind of the roller derby on ice. And if you've got fans pounding the glass and baying for blood, like in the Roman Colosseum, well, then it's what sells. And that's what, that's what you'll get. And that's what we did get. OK, guys, show us what you got. <laughs> the movie Slapshot is based on the true story of a minor league hockey team struggling to win over the fans. What finally does the trick is the Hanson brothers. Their game is brutal and bloody, and the fans can't get enough. The movie may have been fiction, but it reveals a disturbing truth about professional hockey in the 1970s. In both WHA and the NHL, skill is taking a backseat to intimidation. The Philadelphia Flyers, a team affectionately known as the Broad Street Bullies, twice win the Stanley Cup. If Philadelphia Flyers would come in, the Broad Street Bullies, we'd have 16,005 with 2,000 outside waiting to come in. Does that tell you something? The fans in the stands love it. 
The bully approach is a hit with the fans, but it makes the ice a dangerous place for referees like Bruce Hood. The league has sunk to new depths. The mentality of the game has changed. Goon hockey trickles down from the big boys to the amateur leagues. April 16, 1974, a game between Bramley and Hamilton deteriorates into mayhem. Teenage boys pummel each other. Five players and a team trainer are injured as a direct result of fighting. The brawl prompts the Ontario government to hire lawyer Bill McMurtry to investigate violence in amateur hockey. It's not surprising that virtually every boy playing hockey is profoundly influenced by the examples portrayed in the NHL. It's natural for any person to look up to what he has been told are the best and to attempt to emulate them. NHL president Clarence Campbell is called to testify at the hearings. He makes no apologies for what happens on NHL ice. We're in the entertainment business. I don't consider I have any moral sort of responsibility. Still, the league does respond with stiffer fines and penalties. But in the end, the issue is settled on the ice. The thing that eventually trumped goon hockey, and trumped the Flyers, was a better team that didn't use violence to win. And that was the Montreal Canadiens. In 1976, Guy Lafleur and the Montreal Canadiens beat the Philadelphia Flyers to win the Stanley Cup the old-fashioned way. We were so happy to be able to do that and uh, to show everybody that that's how hockey should be played, you know. Uh, there's some great body checking, there's some good fights, but, uh, you know, you, you, you win on your speed and finesse and uh, talent. The cycle is broken, and within a few years, the heydays of goon hockey are gone. In 1979, the WHA, which had started it all, also fades away, driven under by a dwindling fan base and escalating salaries. But three Canadian cities emerge as winners. Edmonton, Winnipeg, and Quebec City keep their teams and join the NHL. In the 1970s, women who want to play hockey have to fight for everything. It's still considered a man's game, and women get almost no funding, coaching, or ice time. But despite the barriers, there are thousands of women and girls who find a way to play. One of them, is Nancy Dragan. Growing up in rural Saskatchewan, she fell in love with the game in the same way as so many Canadian boys. My mother taught me how to skate when I was three years old. I spent countless hours on the backyard rink my father built, skating in old figure skates and shooting pucks against the barn. But it's tough finding games for girls. Marg and Ernie Dragan work hard to give their daughter the chance. Nancy started very early. We went to country rinks where there were no seats, where you had to stand up around the boards and the roofs would sometimes leak on your head. At the University of Saskatchewan, Nancy Dragan revives the women's hockey team. But the Huskyettes have to dress in hand-me-down uniforms from the men's team. And they get little money or practice time. The problem for women's hockey in the 60s, and it got worse in the 70s, was there was no culture of it. We didn't write about it. We didn't report on it. There were no women in the hockey press. It was a non-sport. But Nancy Dragan and the Huskyettes are determined to play and to win. They beat teams from Manitoba, Alberta, and BC. They're crowned the best in the West. And it earns them an invitation to play an American team in Minnesota. 
We financed the trip by raffling off bottles of liquor. We sold tickets at Louis, the university's watering hole. We raised a few hundred bucks. The Saskatchewan Huskyettes leave at the crack of dawn for the thousand mile drive in an unheated van. In Minneapolis, they dress for their game against the Americans with quiet confidence. But the Western Canadian champions are in for a surprise. These American women are fast, skilled, and they play like a well-oiled machine. The best in the West are soundly beaten. We were stunned. We lost because we didn't know how to play like a team. We were a bunch of girls that hardly practiced together because we only had ice time at midnight. Those American women were good, really good. What makes the American women so good at the game is a law called Title IX. Title IX decreed that women's athletics in the United States had to be funded to the same level as men's athletics. You could not make a distinction based on sex. So suddenly, women had money and they had the same amount of access time to the field, to the arena, to whatever they needed to improve their game. And they were excellent hockey players. They opened the eyes of these Canadian women in a big way. Nancy Dragan realizes that Canadian female hockey players need what the Americans have, recognition and financial support. We have to have women's hockey viewed as a bona fide sport for girls. We have to have a female team in every town in the province to increase the number of female hockey players everywhere. She crisscrosses the province, encouraging groups and towns to set up girls' teams. The Saskatoon Flying Stars, teams from Cutknife, Paradise Valley, and Spiritwood begin to blossom. Nancy Dragan goes on TV and radio to promote women's hockey and to change attitudes. A lot of people are, you know, they think girl hockey player and they don't really know how to take it, but it's been more accepted. She writes a newspaper column. I told parents that hockey wasn't a brutal sport, that it was a game of skills, that it teaches discipline, teamwork, and leadership. Let your daughters come to the rinks. Nancy Dragan is not alone. Leagues are forming everywhere. And across the country, women's hockey is gaining momentum. There were women like me from every province fighting for support, money, and our right to play. We were like missionaries. The pressure pays off. Slowly, the Canadian Amateur Hockey Association begins funneling money into the women's game to pay for better coaching and more tournaments. The result is a new generation of top-level players. Haley Wickenheiser from Saskatchewan, Cassie Campbell from Ontario, Manon Réaume from Quebec. We dreamed of a national women's team, and even the Olympics. Maybe someday soon we'd see the day when we turn on the TV and hear the announcer say, she shoots, she scores. Every year, Quebec City celebrates the splendors of winter and hockey. The Pee Wee Tournament is the biggest kids hockey game in the world, and thousands of them from around the globe make the pilgrimage every year. It's here at the Quebec Colisée that fans get their first glimpse at the future stars of professional hockey. This is where Guy Lafleur made his debut in 1962. He earned a record 11 points in a single game and was named the most outstanding player in the tournament. Louis Lorty and his wife Monique have been billeting young players for 10 years. On the eve of the 1974 tournament, the Lortis meet their young guests. Among them is a spindly kid who's broken all the minor league records. I took one look and thought, there's no way, no way he has a killer slap shot. 
His wrists are the size of my little finger. He's small for his age, quiet, you know, kind of timid. A little gauche like all teenagers. Mon Dieu, there is no way this is the kid. The first game we played, I was so nervous. It was sold out and John Beliveau came in the locker room to say hello and wanted to meet me and wish me luck. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And I, I, I didn't know what to say. And so we were playing the team from Texas. It was really sad. Branford beats Texas 25 to nothing. And the crowd is mesmerized by the kid wearing number nine. Wayne Gretzky's debut in Quebec City is spectacular. He ties Guy Lafleur's tournament record in his very first game. I got a call, I was at work in Boston, and I got a call from my father. He said, I've, I've seen the future of hockey. And, and I assumed that he had been to a junior A game and he saw the next number one draft choice or something like that. And I said, who is it? And he said, it's, it's Wayne Gretzky. And I said, who's Wayne Gretzky? And he said, well, he's 11 years old and he's playing for the Brantford Pee -wees. And I said, yeah, my father's finally losing it. You know, let's just humor him along and you know. He looks like the least athletic kid in the world. He looks like the last kid you'd pick in a pickup game. And there he was, uh, uh, the greatest uh, offensive force in organized sports in embryo. The shy one, the kid who was always the youngest and smallest on the team. In a few years, he'll find himself at the center of the greatest hockey renaissance this country has ever seen.